Hello, and welcome to Learning the Social Sciences. Today, we're going to be covering India's independence. So going back over some basic information on India, it's located in South Asia, and it is the birthplace of Hinduism and Buddhism. However, Islam does move into the area, and other religions are also present. Now, it is the birthplace also of the Indus River uh, civilization, one of the first four civilizations on this planet, and it has had numerous great empires throughout its long and rich history, from the Mauryan to the Gupta, from the Delhi Sultanate to the Mughals. However, in 1858, the British um, claimed India as an official colony and called it their crown jewel. Now, the British had been operating in India for quite some time before that under the British East India Company, but in 1858, after the Sepoy Mutiny, they officially put it underneath the British government. So now as we go through the quest for India's independence, I want you to think about political change. Think of history and all the history that we have covered up to this point. How in the world have people caused political change? Who were the people who would traditionally cause this change to happen? And how did colonies prior to World War I gain their independence? So, obviously, with the British taking over India formally, there are going to be groups forming that are going to be opposed to colonization and pushing for their own independence. The Indian National Congress was formed in 1885, and they wanted home rule. They wanted India to be independent. And they actually had British citizens who were also wanting India to have its own independence, people siding with them. Um, however, over time, radical elements started to form within the group. But when Mahatma Gandhi comes to the scene in the 1920s and 1930s, he pushes for a nonviolent strategy, simple non-cooperation with items that India found to be unjust. Now, there's another league that is going to be formed, and that is going to be the Muslim League, formed in 1906. It sought to protect the rights, liberties, and interests of Muslims within India. Some Muslims had a general distrust over the Hindu domination of the Indian National Congress, and they were concerned if they gained their independence, then what was going to be happening with a Muslim minority? Now, this is going to be more of an issue when we go into the 1940s. However, However, the Muslim, League, the Muslim League sought to promote a general understanding between the Muslim community of India and other communities of faith, like Hinduism and Buddhism, and they discouraged violence. Now, whenever you're talking about India's independence, of course, Mahatma Gandhi is going to be coming up. Now, he was born in India in 1869, and he was born into a family where his father did serve as the prime minister of a province within India, and he was a member of the second highest caste in the caste system of India. Now, he also married at the age of 13 in an arranged marriage, and him, him and his wife had their first child when he was 15. However, the baby died in infancy. Now, Gandhi goes to London to study law, and after he receives his law degree, he goes to South Africa to practice, and this is going to be life-changing for Gandhi. When he arrives in South Africa, he simply gets on a train, not knowing really, you know, that there's this system in place that uh, is going to be going at him every single day. And that is the apartheid system or separateness. If you were somebody of color in India, there were a whole bunch of laws and regulations going against you. And when Gandhi showed up, he simply boarded a train in first class for the ticket that he had purchased and was sitting until somebody came up to him and said he had to move to third class simply because of the color of his skin. And he refused. And so he was thrown off of the train. He then went and got on a stagecoach and the driver told him that he had to move to the footboard for a European passenger. And again, he refused because it was only based off of the color of his skin. And with that, the stagecoach driver beat him. 
Now, this is going to cause that change, of course, in Gandhi's life. He became a social activist against racism and prejudice. He created a newspaper called the Indian Opinion in South Africa, and he sought to help increase the rights of Indians within this country with an, ins an insanely strict system of apartheid that is going to be in place until the 1990s. Now, he served as an ambulance corps uh, man during the Boer War, actually helping to set up the ambulance corps, assuming that that was going to help Indians gain more rights within South Africa, but it didn't work. He tried numerous different strategies, but in the end, the apartheid system, as I said, is going to be solidly in place until the 1990s. Now, when Gandhi eventually moves back to India, he is going to assist in their independence movement. And his big thing is going to be non Violence. Now, where does he come up with this truth force? Well, it has kind of different backings to it. First, we have Henry David Thoreau from the United States, which he read about. Uh, um, and Thoreau discussed civil disobedience or the refusal to obey unjust laws as a possible way to create change within a society and politics. Hinduism, his faith, teaches that nonviolence and respect for life is just a part of what we should be following each and every day. And then Christianity, which was is the majority religion of the British people in the 1800s and 1900s, um, taught that people should love their enemies and turn the other cheek. And it's something that Mahatma Gandhi agreed with. And so he figured that if India to gain its independence would go and do non-cooperation and nonviolent strategies, they would let the world know about what was happening in India and remove the facade of democracy that the British had put up. Because in India, it was not a democracy. So Mahatma Gandhi started his push to help India receive its independence when he went up to a province and saw the suffering of the landless serfs and the poor farmers. Now they're forced to grow crops like cotton and indigo. However, you can't eat cotton and you can't eat indigo. And so these people needed to grow food that they can eat. And Gandhi fully supported them and was saying, this is where we can really start. We need to grow what people need to eat, what they need to survive on. And Gandhi was then arrested for causing unrest in the area and was forced to leave the province because people were rallying outside of the jail and really showing their support for Gandhi. And finally, the people of the province just said, kind of, get out, please, get out. Um, however, this is just the beginning of the Gandhi movement. Now, there is an horrible incident that happens uh, in Amritsar in um, 1919. So the British to counter growing independence movements within the country after World War I, when the Indians sent over one million people to go help the British fight in their war, they passed laws limiting more freedoms and rights of the Indian people. And so they gathered for a peaceful protest in Amritsar, and around 10,000 people showed up. However, a British general also showed up, with, showed up with his military unit and opened fire on the crowd, killing men, women, and children. People were trying to jump into a well to try to save themselves from the bullets, climbing up the walls when then Dyer would see this and have the people turn their guns to go and shoot at the people trying to climb up the walls in this area where they were stuck. And around 400 people were killed in this massacre in a peaceful protest. Now, of course, this is going to leave a strong legacy for the Indians for the rest of their colonial history. And it is going to bring in a huge distrust of the British and the British military. And of course, the British themselves are going to go and have mixed reactions to this massacre. Some people supported the actions of Dyer in the time period, while others strongly condemned the massacre. However, there is going to be increased violence after the event in India. 
and more and more Indians are going to be calling for their independence. Now, Gandhi coming and rising through the scenes is going to be able to do something that other people have not been able to do, including the Indian National Congress. He's going to be able to bring together the various castes in his approach because he was somebody that was even calling for freedoms for the untouchables. So he was one that was able to make the masses follow and to fight for their independence. So one of the big events that people talk about with Gandhi is the Salt March. Gandhi was a strong supporter of people going back and making items for themselves so they don't have to rely on the British products anymore. And he has a rich history in the textiles, super rich history, going back all the way to the BCs. And he's going, let's bring this back. And so the spinning wheel to make thread, to make cloth, is going to become a symbol of the movement. And Gandhi himself is going to be sitting Sitting there going and making his own clothing. Now, to the British to counter these types of movements, they enacted a law preventing Indians from making their own salt. Now, salt, that's a touchy topic because one, you can easily make your own salt in India. Um, however, um, salt is also needed for life. Yes, today we tend to have an overabundance of salt. You go and get some French fries and they're kind of like, yeah, layered in salt. Um, however, you need salt to actually live. If your body doesn't get enough salt, then bad things happen. And so the British wanted to have them buy salt from them, and they put an additional tax on it to go and make more money. Well, Gandhi... He's not going to go do that. And so he actually writes the British government and says, hey, I'm going to go break the law and I'm going to go walk to the coast and make my own salt. And he walked, starting with 78 followers, to the sea, 240 miles. And by the point he made it, or by the time he made it there, thousands had joined him. And they went and set up along the sea and made their own salt. And of course, they were arrested. Gandhi, again, arrested for harvesting salt um, directly for the sea. Now, reporters around the world, though, reported what was happening. And they reported some violence that happened along the way. And they gained the attention of the world, just as Gandhi had wanted for the people to see. However, World War II then is going to be breaking out, and India, who had, as I had previously mentioned, sent one million soldiers to assist the British during World War I with the promise of future reforms and freedoms, now in World War II, they're not going to do it. So when World War II broke out, Indians did not want to fight and die for the British people. The Indian National Congress did not support the British with rallying up support for the war. Instead, they said they wanted immediate independence. And what did the British do as a response? Well, they have 20,000 members of the INC arrested. It's basically the entire INC. And so when World War II is over, of course, India now is really saying, we want our independence now. And the British don't have the finances. They don't have the arms, the anything up, and they don't have the public support to keep up the colonies. And the Quit India movement is simply strong. And yes, they finally start going through the process to have India gain its independence, working with the various people like Gina and Nehru. So Muhammad Ali Gina was a lawyer and strong supporter of independence. Originally, he supported a free country for Muslims and Hindus, himself being Muslim. However, he was concerned about a Hindu-dominated government and began to call for an independent Muslim country known as the Land of Pure or Pakistan. And in 1946, they saw violence breaking out between the Hindus and the Muslims, and Gina used this and other items to bring to the British attention to have them grant Pakistan to be its own country with the independence movement. Now, Nuru, who is going to be the first prime minister of India, is going and stating that India should be one. It shouldn't be split, that they can get along. Um, however, that is not going to be the case. And the British are going to decide to split up India into East and West Pakistan. Eventually, it's going to become Pakistan and Bangladesh. But at the time period, it was East and West Pakistan and then India. 
Now, independence for India uh, officially happened on August 15th, 1947, and Gandhi didn't show up to the capital for all of the celebrations. Uh, Pakistan had already gained its independence on August 14th. Um, again, like I had mentioned, you're having an East and West Pakistan, but eventually Bangladesh is going to be formed from this. Now, this is also going to be the start of the Great Partition, a great movement where 11 million people are going to be displaced from their homes and having to move. Because if you are Muslim now in India, you should be moving to Pakistan. And if you are Hindu in now what is Pakistan, you should be moving to to India. And so think about 11 million people moving. You're going to be having a lot of unhappy people and violence is going to be breaking out. Now we don't know the exact numbers, but somewhere between 20,000 to two to three million people are going to be killed in the violence happening after the independence, when people are trying to move to their new locations and other things are happening and chaos is breaking out. <sighs> to try to stop the violence, Gandhi went on a hunger strike until the nation would the nations would stop the killing. Gandhi was prepared to actually die in this fast if need be. However, representatives from the various communities that were involved uh, came and signed a statement that they would live in kind of harmony with each other, with people of other faiths. And so with that, Gandhi ended his fast. However, on January 30th, 1948, Gandhi was on his way to a prayer meeting, and he was going to be going up to a stage um, when a man pushed his way through the crowd and started to kind of give a gesture to Gandhi, and Gandhi was returning, but then instead he pulled out a gun and he shot Gandhi three times in the chest. The assassin wanted a war between Muslims and Hindus. However, what actually happened is the assassination of Gandhi brought the two sides together because Gandhi is the one that made India and Pakistan free to make them independent nations. And so everyone was mourning the loss of Gandhi. And yes, finally in his death, there was this form of unification. Now the countries were made separated, and that will be part two here coming up as we go through the history of Pakistan and India to the present. However, Gandhi at least even in death, was able to be a uniting force for his people. So thank you for listening. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please leave them below. Thank you. Bye-bye.